All right. So we are back. This is now lecture three for CS164. Um, so as you know, this is a new course. So some bumps in the road were inevitable. But rather than wait till some future offering of this course, what I'd like to do, per my note last night, is fix any such uh, deficiencies now. So you saw in my email a whole variety of additional support structure that we're going to put in place. But let me just give you the context and elaborate with a bit more precision. So. Um, we took a look at the demographics of the class, and suffice it to say that even whereas in CS50 we have a range of demographics, those we call less comfortable, those we call more comfortable, that's even more of a gap in a course like this where we have a lot of students, about a third, who took CS50 this past fall, and that is their only prior Harvard uh, CS experience, two, of course, seniors who've been at the likes of Google and Facebook for internships. So there's definitely that gap, but it was not the course's intention to um, uh, put any of those at a disadvantage. Um, certainly we want to ensure that this course is rigorous and actually does provide you with sufficient real world experience with which to tackle some industry jobs, but also we don't want those students who only have taken 50 to flail. So just to give you a sense of who your classmates are, when we asked for the partnership form a while back when you took CS50, so again about a third of the folks in the class just took 50 this past fall, and then you can see from the various fall 2010, 9, 8, and never took CS50 who your classmates are. So I put this up mostly to assure that 34% that there's a whole bunch of you here and a lot of the support uh, changes that we've made are meant to ensure that you all can succeed even as we maintain the rigor of the course for those with that additional experience. So what's, um, what has changed? So one, we'll introduce sections. Um, one lecture a week, albeit two hours, isn't necessarily enough to wrap your mind around certain topics and so Tommy will start leading on Wednesday afternoons at 4 p.m. in Pierce 301, a weekly section. If that time doesn't work, that's fine um, because it will be filmed and played based online as are the lectures. So labs have proved to be fairly low energy and passive where we just kind of stand around waiting for questions and you just kind of sit around checking email um, or, you know, in fairness, working on working to some extent on the labs, but really this past week focusing on the project. Understandably so, but I think we've questioned their value in their original form. So what we decided to do is reboot labs altogether, and what we will do on a cyclical basis is redesign them as code reviews, design reviews, and uh, office hours. So we will see in a moment what that means for the schedule. And the only material change for those of you, especially with additional experience, lest you have responded to my email from last night saying that the course itself is changing. Really, the only material change is that the expectations for that initial submission, instead of it being a beta, which by definition in industry usually means all the features are there, even if it's just buggy, what we did decide to do is call this an alpha, which is more than just the semantics of it, but rather to say you absolutely have to have something at that point. So you've met a milestone, but the motivation there is so that we, the staff, can then weigh in during code reviews that week and get a sense of whether or not you're actually on a good path. But the expectations ultimately for the projects will remain the same, but the release cycle should make them more manageable. So it was my fault that Project Zero's time frame between design doc and beta was so terribly short, and I recognized the angst that that caused. It was not intentional. So what we did was rethink the re entire semester schedule, both for Project Zero onward, um, and what you'll find now is that there's at least a weekend preceding any of the non-trivial milestones. The idea there is that, especially as you're working with a partner, this will just give you more wiggle room to actually self-schedule when you guys are going to tackle things. And then note we also push the release dates a couple days out toward week's end so that you don't just have a week, but rather a week and a bit to actually take things from alpha to completion. And notice, too, how things line up on Tuesdays. So whereas labs used to, again, be these hands-on activities, the idea now is that when you've submitted your design doc and style guide by noon on a Tuesday, that Tuesday night and Wednesday night and Thursday night will be an opportunity with the TFs to actually look at um, your design doc, make improvements, look at the design docs of classmates around you perhaps and weigh in with advice. Similarly with the alphas now being on Tuesday afternoons at noon, so will Tuesday nights and Wednesday nights and Thursday nights be an opportunity then both with the staff and with classmates to look at your code, where you're at, so that you can make improvements earlier rather than later. Um, I realized too that because originally we had decided to do some online based peer code reviews as well as have you wait for feedback from the staff, we the staff were also in these artificial delays into the release cycle such that it might be three days before you actually get feedback and yet the next deadline is looming some three, four days later. So with this approach, I think we can maximize um, the period of time between milestones so that you can continue working or at least accommodate your schedules a little more effectively. So do continue to speak up if things prove rough, but let me emphasize though 
the workload of the course, particularly for those with uh, additional experience, is intended to stay the same. So here's where I need to couple some sympathy with some tough love. Um, so 50 was a lot of work. But for our first course in computer science, um, it was typically estimated at 10, 12, though in fairness, 20, 25 hours a week, depending on the person in the course. Um, but this, is cor this course is indeed one where the projects are meant to take some 30 plus hours. Um, this is uh, actually not even a record among CS courses at Harvard, but do realize that this is a three digit uh, computer science course, and so even though expectations are high, these structural changes are meant to ensure that you have the support structure in place with which to actually tackle this course successfully. But ultimately, if you were stressing over the fact that this, uh, you spent 20 hours last week on the course, like that's kind of the right ballpark for a course like this. So do keep that in mind and do realize now that there's a more adequate, we hope, support structure in place with which to tackle those things. So project one. So the reality is here, even with these structural changes, the reality is you were going to see this peak and then this trough whereby for project one, it's entirely within your discretion to propose the project that you want to do. And you can stay within your newfound or brimming comfort zone, whereby you can use CodeIgniter for this, you can use some jQuery mobile for this, and you can stay within the realm of the technologies that you've been struggling with or spending a uh, ridiculous amount of time with of late so as to make something that we don't tell you to make, but that you have uh, chosen to make. So realize there's that opportunity. Also with project one, though, you'll be able to go off on your own. If you've absolutely hated CodeIgniter, that's perfectly fine. You can go off and use some other framework. You can roll your own. And so you'll see in the spec, which we'll post in a day or so, exactly how much discretion you have. And it will boil down to a whole lot, both as to what you make and how you make it. So realize you're going to have a lot more control now with this next cycle. And even given that the time frame is now such that the release for project one isn't due until March 23rd, there's a good amount of breathing room there. It's still going to be a lot of work, but at least now you can plan the next month to tackle something of interest to you. So any questions on logistics, structure, or otherwise? OK, so even if you and your partner do still have concerns or are wondering if this is sort of something you can manage, do strike up a chat with me or Tommy or Rob uh, during break or right after. So project one. So we'll put more details in the spec, but we've been collecting ideas um, from folks on campus, staff and students alike. Um, and there's a dozen or more ideas there. So if you're sort of flailing about having no idea what you would want to make in terms of a web-based mobile app, at least check that out, because you can at least make someone else on campus happy by solving some problem they have. So you'll see some departmental type projects there, student groups. And and then some random ones as well. And just to give you a sense of where we're going in lecture, so today we'll look at design patterns, albeit in the context of PHP. And we'll define what that means in just a bit. But realize we dive into iOS and Objective-C quite soon. Indeed, next week we will introduce a language called Objective-C, uh, which is essentially an object-oriented superset of the language we already know as C. Um, and we'll transition from there to looking at uh, the iOS SDK, Software Development Kit, and the frameworks that Apple provides, and underneath them exactly what design paradigms they adhere to that are representative of not just Apple and uh, iOS development, but really software development more generally. Um, as we proceed then through the semester, we'll introduce some best practices uh, unit tests, for instance, in the context of Objective-C and Xcode. But those same ideas can be retroactively applied to things like PHP and even uh, web programming with uh, front-end user interface testing. And we'll talk toward term's end about scalability. So if you do have this next greatest idea, it's probably, one, not going to be sufficient to run it off your laptop and it's not going to be sufficient to run it off a single server like cloud.cs50.net. You need to start thinking ultimately about how you can spread some new and amazing product that you have across multiple servers, across multiple databases, across multiple geographies. And so we'll look at some of those issues so that when you sit down to design your project, even if you only have one user yourself initially, at least you don't have to revamp it three to 12 months later just because you didn't anticipate having to deal with issues of load and scale. I mean, case in point, even Harvard courses, um, the CS 50 shopping tool, if you've used it, we get about 3,500 users now per semester. And it's very slow at certain times of the day, right? The night right before classes begin, it actually does slow to a crawl. And that's frankly because I didn't really anticipate initially that 3,500 people would actually care to use this, right? Shuttle boys used by a few hundred people. And so we too have to go back in over the course of the summer, retool that so that we're not going to anticipate thousands or tens of thousands of users, certainly. But it'd kind of be nice if you can use it the night before classes actually begin. So we'll learn from our own lessons there. And then also security. We talk a little bit about these issues in 50, but there's so many other ways in which people can exploit your code or you can make mistakes that make your code and data vulnerable. So we'll look at those as well. And now, 
Um, at the risk of harming um, attendance irre uh, irre uh, irreparably, um, we finally introduced on the course's website um, the ability to speed me up. So if you go to um, cs164.tv, you'll recall that this was our first lecture here. Let me turn the music off. <laughs> So this was me at this normal voice. Small room for me to start shouting. This is something. So just welcome to computer science uh, 164. This is meant to be a continuation from Genesis, right? Because we've been doing this past all four years prior. Indeed. Let's just get to the part with Rob. <laughs> all right. So you can now take CS 164 50 percent faster. Um, so we'll we'll maybe see you next week. The reality is, though, now I just have an incentive to talk even faster, so this feature is completely useless if you try to use it online. Um, <laughs> so um, without further ado, and you can also slow certain folks, myself included, down. Um, so today is ultimately about design patterns. So we're not going to look at CodeIgniter per se, and we'll find, in fact, retroactively, that CodeIgniter does offer one or more of these things called design patterns, which are not really sort of new technologies or fundamental um, sort of models that you must adhere to, but rather they're ways of approaching common problems. The reality is if you've been programming for some time, whether it's months or years, you probably find yourself, when you sit down to do a new project, stealing code or at least stealing ideas from some previous project um, and realizing that, wow, I've made something that's quite like this before. The aesthetics might be completely different. The data set might be completely different. But honestly, odds are if you did a web-based final project in CS50, there's a non-trivial number of you who essentially took P set 7, CS50 finances code, copy the whole directory and then just started ripping out what you didn't want and putting in what you did want so that you at least had a starting point. But even there, as we've seen, it's not, the PSET 7 was not the best structured design because there was so much view, there was so much controller sort of commingled in there. And it would be very hard to, for instance, all of a sudden make CS50 Finance support, say, a mobile phone without redoing absolutely everything. So among the ideas we'll look at today through some concrete examples are how, when you have some coding problem to solve, how can you solve sort of approach your code in such a way that it just makes it easier to maintain and you don't can actually ultimately write even less code. So here are just a few popular ones. Um, and if you look back at the course's syllabus, there's a recommended book called Design <laughs> Patterns by the so-called Gang of Four, a very um, famous book from a few years back that introduced and really popularized a lot of these design patterns. So even though we'll use PHP today, the reality is that most of these ideas transcend the specific language. And we'll see some of these same ideas in Objective-C. You could apply them to JavaScript. You can apply them to C, C++, um, depending on the model in question. But you'll find that a number of these are actually object-oriented in nature, which is a topic we'll look at in some detail today, but then also next week when we begin begin to look at iOS and Objective-C. So MVC is actually a design pattern, right? We already crossed one of these off the list. And even though you might be struggling with the actual incarnation of it in CodeIgniter, if you think back or look back at some of the homegrown examples we did a week and two ago, where I had the MVC1 directory, MVC2, MVC3, we did like nine examples of MVC, but homegrown, completely manufactured myself. And I had the header function and the footer function, or the more generalized render function. And so when we say design patterns, we mean modeling your code in this sort of generic way so that you can solve a new problem, but in the same way you solved some previous problems. So MVC is a perfect example of that that just makes it easier, arguably, to solve common types of problems. And by problem here, I mean a mobile website right? that's got multiple pages and that pulls data from a database. So singleton pattern. This is actually a very popular one, and we'll look at it in some detail today. And we've actually been using it. What does it mean if you're using this so-called singleton pattern. Anyone know? Yeah. Yeah, so it's a class that you just have one instance of. So again, we'll talk more about object-oriented programming if you haven't quite wrapped your mind around it. But in object-oriented programming, you generally have these things called classes, though that's not necessarily the case. JavaScript, for instance, is what's called a prototype-based language. But a class is kind of like a template, not to be confused with MVC. It's like the blueprints for some data structure that's going to have zero or more pieces of data inside of it and zero or more methods, aka functions, inside of it. And so with that definition of a class, what then is an object before we come back to singleton? Yeah. Perfect. It's an instance of the class. So if you think of a class, again, as sort of a, a, 
a template or a blueprint or, or a mold, if you will. The object is the thing that comes out of the mold. And you can make as many of these objects as you want by just refilling the mold and taking the output out. So a class is, again, sort of the mold out of which you can make objects. And it's actually quite useful to have multiple instances of the same class. If you've got a class, like we talked about for a student, and you have 100 or so students, it's probably nice to have different objects representing each of those students.、Um, alternatively, you could have a student's object, inside of which is maybe an array. But that's getting a little messy, right? The idea of actually modeling real world entities with classes is so that you can model each independently. So in the singleton model, though, you only have one instance of a given class. So this probably isn't really appropriate for a student class, but you've actually been using a singleton pattern、um, the past week or two in the context of CodeIgniter. Can you think of an example where there's apparently only one of something or of one class? Yeah. OK, a y so one course.、Um, yeah, so quite possibly. So if you have a model called course and you call CodeIgniter's load method so that you can then access the course object as this arrow course, absolutely. That's the case of the singleton pattern. And the one that comes for free, even if you haven't even、um, you, uh, implemented the notion of a course, is the database connection. So we used the database、uh, class in CodeIgniter last week. You've probably been using it or might be using it if you're using MySQL for your project. So when you say this arrow DB for database, that's a singleton object. And you configure that singleton object where? Well, not through parameters, but it's through like the database.php file. Recall you had to go in there once, or you or your partner had to add your username and your password and the like. So you configure that, and then CodeIgniter magically hands you one object. And so CodeIgniter is a big fan of this, for better or for worse, of passing you single instances of most classes. But CodeIgniter gets a little messy in that even if you have the notion of a course or a student or an instructor, CodeIgniter tends not to use a course object or a student object or an instructor object. It rather just hands you back from the database standard class object. So if unfamiliar, know that PHP has this very generic class called standard class. And this is the equivalent of Java's object class, if you took APCS or similar. So it's sort of a base class that is just a very generic way of putting stuff inside of some container. It's like a, a struct in C, but it can, in theory, also have methods、uh, associated with it. At least it can once you start defining one more precisely. So, in short, singletons are when you have just one instance of a class. Why is this useful? It doesn't seem useful in the case of a student. Necessarily. When would you want, or why would you want, only one of something, perhaps? Let's use the database example. Why might it be compelling to only have a single database object that you access throughout your code? Yeah. OK, a y so you don't have to change your configuration options anytime. You create this object once, or in the case of CodeIgniter, it does it somewhere for you among its many files that have been written for you. They just configure it once and hand it to you. So that's compelling. Yeah. OK, a y so you don't have to trace problems that you might have back to multiple potential sources. You can go straight to the class or the object in question. Does that have anything to do with just like the amount of queries you might make if you set up multiple instances of one object and like the data that could be tied up? Yeah, so this is, this is getting a little better and a little more compelling, I think, now technologically. It, the reality is that when you talk to a database, you might want to issue multiple selects, multiple inserts, multiple deletes. But what you probably don't need to do again and again is call MySQL Connect. Or MySQL select DB. So think back to CS50、um, when we use those methods in particular, which were very much hard coded for MySQL. Now, CodeIgniter uses its own、uh, abstraction layer, so to speak, for database connections. So you can use Oracle or MySQL or something else. It genericizes the functions. But you probably, every time you issue a select in your、uh, Harvard Courses tool, you don't want to have to connect to the database, select the database, and then issue your select query, and then do this again and again, certainly not in some loop. So it's compelling. To maybe have one instance of an object if that object is already doing something useful that only needs to be done up front. So, in the case of the singleton model, you might connect to the database, select the specific database you want to use on that server, and then thereafter, you want all queries to be routed through that same object. You just don't need to have multiple connections. Now, conversely, what's a downside that derives from this same logic? What's bad about the singleton model? Yeah. Perfect. 
Yeah, right. What's as, it's just as, as it's an advantage. It's also arguably a disadvantage if you actually want to talk to multiple databases. Now, in the apps you've done in 50 and are probably working on now, there's not necessarily a motivation to talk to multiple databases at once. But certainly, as a project grows in size and has even more classes and controllers and models, it feels like it'd be compelling to be able to at least have the ability to connect to multiple databases. And the singleton pattern tends to get in the way of that. And also, when it comes to testing, it can also introduce issues. That we'll see perhaps、um, over time when we move to that particular topic.、Um, so, DAO, data access objects. So, this is kind of a fancy, unenlightening way of describing a very common model. And in fact, what CodeIgniter calls models are kind of reflective of this particular pattern. This model、uh, essentially prescribes that you have a class. That for now, this is an oversimplification, has a whole bunch of helper methods inside of it. So, if you want to have a, a model in CodeIgniter called courses, well, inside of that courses class, you might have a method like get courses, get instructors,、uh, get day, get time, things that, or rather, get times, things that are related to courses as a whole. But let me wave my hand at this for a moment, and we'll come back to this in more detail with some actual code. What about active record? Those of you with experience beyond PHP for web programming, where do you see this a lot? Oh, I think I heard it.、Um, basically, it's,、um, it's a way to access the database without doing sort of like manual queries.、So、okay, good.、Uh, basically, it's sort of like a wrapper around what your database model is and gives you a bunch of very convenient methods for interacting with it. Okay. And depending on what your database is, it could be very different. It's not like you're actually messing with the database.、It's、okay. <laughs> okay, good. So let me oversimplify. So, active record is a means of interacting with a database and reading and writing records, let's call them, or rows more concretely in a relational database, but without writing a lot of those queries yourself.、Right? A lot of the queries you type for、um, any SQL things actually follow this silly paradigm CRUD create, read, update, delete.、Um, this maps roughly to insert,、uh, select, update, and delete. Um, but CRUD apparently sounded better.、Um, and there's different ways that communicate this exact same acronym, but it's a very common model, especially in relational databases, where there's really only four primary operations, the four CRUD operations. And so throughout your code, both for project zero and maybe even past projects you've worked on, you probably did issue a lot of selects and a lot of inserts and a lot of deletes. And certainly in a project like project zero, if you have things like a course and an instructor and a location, you know, any of these real world entities, you might be copying a lot. Of the same code that differs only in terms of like, the table name, maybe only in terms of the field name. So there's a lot of structural redundancy there. So Active Record is meant to abstract away a lot of those uninteresting operations for adding a record, deleting a record, updating a record, and just give you a class based interface for doing those very common operations without ever actually touching SQL. Let me actually fast forward to a concrete example. In the Active Record model, and this is some、uh, PHP pseudocode,、um, but it's actually syntactically correct. In In Active Record, if you want to insert a new course into your database, you don't use the insert query for SQL. You instead create a new object, which in this case is、uh, called course. So, capital C course, this, again, for those unfamiliar, when defining classes, and CodeIgniter messes this up a little bit. Sometimes the class name should be capital C.、Um, this is the invocation of what's called the constructor, which is a method that is automatically invoked whenever you instantiate an object, create an object for the first time, that can, if you want, take arguments. But I've just chosen not to give it any arguments here. And the new keyword means actually allocate、um, memory on the heap. For this new object. All right, so this gives me essentially the empty container that is a course, but there's nothing inside of it. So, how do I put stuff inside of it? Well, let me put a cat num of like 7295. And let me put a title of, oops, I'm missing a、uh, dollar sign. So, I guess it is pseudocode. Now it's actually code. All right, so now I'm putting in the title of the course here, and then this is the magic or the abstraction that Active Record gives you. You just say save. And what the save method does, which was implemented maybe by you, but more likely by the framework that is automatically generating the requisite code for you, this will now create the equivalent of something like this SQL query without you having to care about the specifics. It will do something like、uh, insert into courses. Something like catnum, title, and then values,、uh, 7295, mobile, dot, dot, dot. So it will induce that query for you. And similarly, can you update fields or delete records and the like? So this is active record. 
Is there any advantage to like hard writing the actual uh, SQL queries as opposed to using active record? Good question. Is, um, is there any advantage to actually writing the queries yourself? Short answer is it depends. For very simple queries like this, not really. And one of the reasons for the popularization of this active record model, especially in the Ruby on Rails community, is just it's so damn easy to do things quickly. You could whip up your own core shopping tool potentially much faster if you don't have to think about a lot of the queries and the database design and the like. But what you give up, arguably, is a lot of control. And if you're actually trying to really give a lot of thought to your schema design, to primary keys, foreign keys, and you know know what the real world implications are for performance on doing selects in certain ways or doing joins in certain ways, you might not want to save your time by using this model at the expense of performance potentially. But again, for relatively simple websites where you're talking hundreds, thousands of users, and it's much more important to ship the thing within a week and move on to something else, these models can really help. Um, now, CodeIgniter does not really provide this model. In fact, they have a horrific, I think, um, implementation of this, whereby you actually use, for instance, your model class, which itself has a whole bunch of methods, like get courses, and then you use this arrow. Actually, let's see if we can. Uh, let me see if I can find the documentation in question so I can rant slightly for just a moment. Uh, CodeIgniter model. Let's see if it's this one. Yeah, so this. So I think this is horrific. Um, so this is their, what's the class, this class? And you can get the counterpoint, I'm sure, in section this week when Tommy uh, is instead on the soapbox that, instead of me. Um, so this is their blog model that extends CodeIgniter model. So you probably did something like this for um, your course or courses model thus far for the project. Um, but then you have apparently these things here, which we'll talk a little bit, we'll see something like this in a little bit, where these are essentially public data members inside of this class. And then you have this construct method, which this is, um, for now, I'm going to wave my hand at. And then you have these things. So this method here, get last 10 entries, this method, based on its name and what it's actually doing, is actually consistent with this pattern uh, data access objects, DAO. And we'll see this more concretely with our own code outside of the CodeIgniter framework. So this is pr actually pretty clean, right? Because then you would say this arrow course, arrow get last 10 entries. And for me, I would call it courses, but the idea, or blog in this case. So this, it, uh, the takeaway is the same. You have this sort of generic class called blog model, and you have this helper method inside of it that gets you something related to the blog. But then where they start blurring things in the interest of keeping things simple um, is then they do something like this, where similarly can use this exact same class and store inside of this particular instance of the class a whole bunch of fields like title and content and date and then you can call this db insert to insert yourself, the current model object, into the database. So this is very much like a blurring of these lines. Like it's both trying to do active record and it's also trying to do DAO, but it's just conceptually mixing metaphors, I think. Either the class should do uh, things like your helper methods and talk to the database and get you blog entries or get you courses, or it should model some real world entity like the blog entry. This model here is trying to do both. Um, now on the flip side, learning CodeIgniter and actually making something with it is actually relatively fast compared to a lot of the more sophisticated alternatives, and I'll rattle off a few later today, but you'll be in, uh, invited to um, use any framework or none at all for project one, but just realize that the learning curve tends to be higher even if the implementation tends to be cleaner. So these are just tensions. There is rarely will you find any framework in life that you love. You're almost always going to hate it for some reason, and this is one of my pet peeves here. What's that? Any, yes, so it still has to be, but like, uh, we'd rather you not go off and implement things in Python or Ruby, just because it's um, useful on scale for us to at least use the same languages. But in terms of frameworks, we won't care for project one. All right, so let's come back to this. So there's one sort of additional soapbox thing that I can say here. I personally have never liked this model, though I definitely see the utility of being able to do things so relatively easy. It's never kind of rubbed me the right way that I can create an essentially an empty course object, which is called a course, but doesn't really represent a course yet. And then I have to manually put inside of it the requisite fields. And now this is actually a course that I can save to my database. To me, it's just a little messy if the approach you take is to sort of manually insert things in this way. Now, we'll see, especially in Objective-C, better use of constructors. So I actually would like this a little more, where you actually do something like 7295 mobile 
dot, dot, dot. So this is, for those unfamiliar, an example of an explicit constructor that actually takes arguments. And in this model, when you create this empty container on the heap, because I've passed in arguments this time, now those arguments should be automatically put inside of the object. And for those unfamiliar, and we'll see an example of this today, if I wanted to implement this course method, let me just go ahead and put this in context so that this is indeed not just all pseudocode. If I had something like uh, class course in PHP, what I can do here is public uh, function underscore underscore construct. In PHP, anytime you have a double underscore, it means it's a special function reserved by the PHP folks. So you better not name your own methods with those names. Then I'm going to do something like catnum and title. <laughs> And then I'm going to go in here. And what I could do then is upon being invoked, I can say this catnum gets title. Or no, that's be stupid. Gets catnum. And then down here, I can do something the same. And PHP, frankly, is a little lazy. So it's by no means a perfect or beautiful language all the time. Um, just because I've simply said this catnum and this title, those properties, even though they're not explicitly defined, will automatically now exist inside of the objects, which is a little sloppy design. So if I really want to be more rigorous, I can use the var keyword. But that's actually a little retro now. What I would instead do is something like public uh, catnum. And then I would say something like public uh, title. Now, even this, and we'll come back to this, this is not perfect. Now, this is explicitly telling the world a course has a catalog number and a title. And that's a good thing, especially in the context of working with a partner or writing open source software that other people are going to read. Now you're sort of engaging in a contract, so to speak, with other developers or with the readers of your code, whereby you're committing to those fields now existing. Now, this is a little messy because if they're public in this way, what does that mean for users of your code? If this is uh, analogous to Java, if that's your background for OOP, this means that if I have an object like C gets new course, and I do 7295 comma mobile dot dot dot, so this gives me an object C. Another person who uses my code could just go ahead and change this to like 555. And so this breaks this abstraction between having objects that encapsulate or hide data by exposing those same fields in a mutable way so that anyone can just change that field now. Even you might accidentally now change that field, an assignment operator in the wrong place. So this kind of violates the idea of data encapsulation or data hiding. So in Java or here in PHP, how can I prevent users from touching catnum or title? Yeah, so we can change it to private. And the, the keyword essentially means just that, whereas public means anyone who creates an object of this class can access its public data members. Now I can simply do this, but now what's the downside? You can't actually read them. So now this is a bit of a problem. So now we actually need to create what the world generally calls getters and setters. Um, but there's other ways of doing this, where I can now say get catnum or something like that. And then down here, I can simply say, return this catnum. And even though it's private, because this method is inside of the class, he can, by definition of private, actually access that property. So now, effectively, I've created some read-only properties. And in Objective-C, we'll actually see much slicker uh, ways of doing this automatically without having to write code ourselves. And actually, for the curious, those of you who'd like to really um, sort of take your PHP savvy to the next level, know that PHP has a whole bunch of magical methods, um, their word, not ours, that begin with underscore, underscore. And they are things like underscore, underscore, get. And things like underscore, underscore, set, name, value. And what's at, there are actually some really neat features of PHP, whereby you actually don't have to hard code all of these getters and setters. And you don't have to explicitly enumerate all of your fields, uh, like catnum and title. Instead, you can use these magical methods. And whenever the user tries to do something like this, this will invoke the method called underscore, underscore, get if there is no explicit property called catnum defined. So then you don't effectively have to write all of these getters and setters, which is like a, a nasty um, sort of paradigm in the Java world, where you litter your class with all of these damn getters and setters for every damn field inside of a class. You can clean that up in PHP in this one way by using these automagical methods that will, can do anything you want if you implement them yourself. So for more on that, just read up on get and set and magical methods uh, more generally in PHP, but you can do some nice things. But for now, the takeaway is here we have a class. Um, we've been making multiple instances thereof. 
at least if we're not using the singleton model. And we can now control how data is stored or encapsulated inside of it. So a quick overview of just a couple of other approaches. So there's this thing called the factory method. You might have used this a lot in Java if you're, if you're using some method to actually create objects instead of calling new. And I'm going to wave my hands at that for now, but we'll likely see that again before long. There's this principle, too, of lazy loading. What does it mean to lazy load something in the context of objects and classes and maybe even databases? Yeah. OK, good. So it's a, a well, uh, lazy loading wouldn't so much be a preemptive join, but rather a lazy join, right? Doing it later when you actually want the data. OK, so let me, so correct, but the opposite. So <laughs> in the model of lazy loading, let's consider a concrete example. So and we'll, after break, we'll actually look at the courses.xml data and one way in which we might tease it apart into multiple tables. But let's suppose for now, um, and this will be familiar to many of you if using MySQL and various tables for courses.xml, let's suppose that you have a courses table that has things like catnum and title and the sort of high level information. What other tables do many of you probably also have? Sorry? Faculty. So faculty table. And the faculty table just has all of the various faculty at Harvard. And what was the motivation, probably, for having a separate faculty table, if that's the route you went? Because uh, a single course can have multiple instructors. OK, single course can have multiple instructors. And? Exactly. An instructor can teach two courses, right? So I teach CS50, I teach CS164. It'd be kind of stupid to have David J. Malin and his email address and his unique ID in two places in your database if you could just factor that out and just put me in one place. And that goes for many other people as well. And what other tables might you have? Maybe locations. You could factor out buildings and rooms, arguably. Uh, what else? Court, sorry? The schedules, course meeting times, you could factor out. So in short, what is associated with a course? Well, if you look at the XML file for a course, the XML actually kind of captures everything. You have all the high-level data, like catalog number and title. But then you might have an array of some sort, a list of faculty. You might have a list of meeting times, and so forth. So if those are now stored in multiple tables, what does it mean to implement a method called get course? Suppose I want to call a method like get course, and the usage for that I want to be something like course gets gets course based on its catalog number. Well, what should come back? Well, odds are I want to get back a, class, a course object, so something that is defined like this somewhere. But then if I want to get that course's instructors, what's the implication? Well, this method get course had better do a select on my courses table, but also a select on my my faculty table, but then if I also want to know the meeting times, I then have to do a third select on a third table, which now might be rubbing you the wrong way because, my god, now why didn't I just put everything in one huge table so I don't have to triple the number of SQL queries I make? Now, of course, we saw last week that you can join and you can, or you can do multiple selects to actually get back this data, but lazy loading is all about let's just avoid that issue. <laughs> let's not waste time up front issuing three separate SQL queries because you know what? Statistically, you know, this guy who's using this API, he rarely even asks for the instructors. He rarely asks for the course meeting times. He's just looking for the actual raw courses. So lazy loading is a principle that says we'll only select the data at the very last possible minute. So what would that mean? Well, that would mean in the course class, you might actually have a method. So public function get instructors. And this is implemented somehow. And you might also have public function get meeting times or something to that effect. And you know what's inside of these curly braces? Somewhere in there is the select from instructors table. And in here is somehow, and this maybe is abstracted away with some other um, design paradigm, but select from meetings dot, dot, dot and so forth. So you can implement this idea of lazy loading by just only issuing the SQL queries, in this case, on demand, when you actually ask for that data. OK. So you wouldn't have to write these methods? So, uh, so uh, wouldn't have to. Why? No, sorry. You, so you're saying the whole concept of lazy loading is that you do have to You do. So this 
class called course that I just whipped up in pseudocode adheres to this principle of lazy loading because the only thing that I actually load initially is the high level stuff like course catalog number and the uh, title and so forth. So let's actually just be more clear, and we'll see this again after the break with actual compilable code. If I also have now a class called courses, this could be called a model. So this is kind of what you're used to with CodeIgniter, but this adheres to what we'll call the data access object paradigm. In this class, I'm going to have public function get courses, uh, or rather get course based on catnum. And what I'm going to do here is something like select from courses where catnum, catnum equals catnum, and then I'm going to return that row, let's say. But I'm going to return that row not as an associative array as we used to in CS50 and with the MySQL fetch associ methods and the functions and the like. Rather, this query, albeit in pseudocode, is going to instead create the equivalent of C gets new course, then in pseudocode, put fields from SQL query in C object, and then I'm going to do this. So again, we'll see real code in a bit, but for now, the pseudocode captures the idea of one, the DAO model, where it's really just helper methods, all somehow related to the correspondingly named table, courses in this case. But when you actually return a course, if you now want to adhere to this principle of lazy loading, well, a course itself can do on demand its own queries to get additional information. What's the alternative? Well, the alternative would be before you do this, you could do select star from instructors where catnum equals and so forth. And then in pseudocode, put those fields inside C2, then return C. So this is not lazy loading. This is actually loading everything preemptively. If we continue on this path, returning a much bigger object, which is arguably useful for what reason? Why might you want to not lazily load and instead just grab everything up front? Yeah. So caching, so one, you know, yes, you have to issue three queries, but we can introduce this idea of caching, which we'll revisit in our scalability lecture, where caching, frankly, solves a lot of the world's problems, right? If you're doing something a lot, cache the answer so that, yeah, it's expensive the first time, but if you amortize that cost over the next 10 or 100 or 1,000 queries, maybe we can avoid talking to the database at all. So in short, very useful. And it's also a little cleaner, too, if initially you want to start modeling your real world with similarly named entities, courses, to give you a generic interface to all the courses, but then a course API, which gives you a very concrete interface to just one. And each of them can have its own queries inside of it. Um, lastly, the observer pattern. And there's dozens more. And for project one, what we'll do is recommend some reading on some of these patterns in the context of PHP. Um, I think you'll often find that if you're using a framework like CodeIgniter or something else, you're either going to be forced to adhere to one or more design patterns, whether or not you like it, as in the case of CodeIgniter. But any other framework, too, will just make you adhere to their own patterns, most likely. Or if you actually start rolling things your own and implementing things from scratch, you'll find that these are often uh, very common paradigms to adhere to rather than reinventing the wheel. And I'll admit, frankly, and as you read up on these things, especially if you've been programming for a couple of years now, um, even I had this realization. I forget which. It wasn't one of these on the list. But recently, I was reading up on some new fancy design pattern. I was like, oh my god, I implemented, I, I invented that two years ago. Because um, now someone had come up with a name for just something, frankly, that flowed naturally from some prior problem I had solved. And I don't even remember what it was, but I remember being angry that this guy now got to name this design pattern. Um, Observer, though, refers refers to what's called a, a publish subscribe method, but I'll wave my hand at that for now because we'll see that a whole lot in iOS. Any questions? No? All right, so let's go ahead and take our five minute break here and we'll resume with some actual code. So we are back. So just to recap, recall that the singleton design pattern generally refers to having some class of interest to you, but only having one object of it. We've seen this in CodeIgniter in the context of databases. And we'll see it again, but this time with our own homegrown code so that we can sort of ignore the distractions and the peculiarities of that particular framework and focus really on the core idea. And we'll also look at this data access object model, which tends to work very nicely in conjunction um, with the sorts of code that I was just sketching as pseudo 
pseudocode in Notepad there just a moment ago. So in terms of applying this to Project Zero and Project One, the mental model should be as follows. Um, shoehorning some of this the, these examples into CodeIgniter won't quite work because, again, when using a framework, you typically have to adapt to it and not so much the other way around. Um, if you find yourself doing it the other way around, that's the point at which you start making your own framework or shopping around for something else. So just realize the goal is not to inject the same code into your CodeIgniter solutions, but to recognize it as representative of the same ideas we're going to see in Objective C starting in a week, um, and also as an alternative to using something like CI so that for, say, Project One, you can actually consider doing a little more of it on your own from scratch, especially if that helps you wrap your mind around some of the uh, particular aspects of these things. So we need, let's do this. Let me go into courses.xml just for a quick teaser of what has been in here, but I'm guessing you're all too familiar with this by now. Um, so what's nice about the XML file, let me increase the font size. What's nice about the XML file is that imperfect though it is structurally, it at least does embody within a single course element most everything you need for that particular course. But there's a number of issues, right? We don't have a separate XML file for all the departments at Harvard. We don't have a separate XML file for all of the things called course groups, which are different, right? Department is something like Division of Engineering and Applied Sciences, but course group is computer science. And arguably, it's usually the latter that actual students care about. Um, and then you don't have a faculty XML file. Rather, you have the same faculty intermingled again and again and again in all of the various courses that they teach. So when importing this XML file, and let's not spend too much time on the import here, because odds are you're at this point or beyond. But let me propose a few tweaks that you might make to your own import strip, script, or even if you're content with how you've imported the data, something to keep in mind for project one or beyond when you have to go through a similar exercise, designing a database schema and getting a whole lot of data into it, not just once, but rather in a way that you can do it again and again. For instance, if your import script right now is not designed in such a way that you could rerun it, if we hand you a new courses.xml file tomorrow without having to manually delete all of your tables and start fresh with PHP and Mindman, like there's an opportunity there for improvement. It's not an explicit requirement, and this is one of the uh, curveballs we might have thrown you, but these are the kinds of things you want to keep in mind, designing with reusability in mind. So let me propose this, and you're, this code is online, so you're welcome to adapt some of its own features or not at all if you would like, or if you're still at at that point with the first uh, Project Zero. But let me point out a few salient design decisions I made when importing just part of the XML file. This does not load everything that you need, but it does load enough so that we can have an interesting conversation in the context of design patterns now. So among the, thing, the design decisions I made for this import script is one. Um, and for those unfamiliar who forgot, in 50, when you ran, wrote a command line script or we wrote, implemented Speller with a command line script, recall that just because PHP is 99% of the time used in web context doesn't mean it has to be. Right? You can use it for what are called command line scripts. And the easiest way to do this is to start the top of your file with the so-called shebang, which is just the path to the interpreter that you want to use to actually execute this file. And it doesn't have to be PHP. It can be Bash, which is a shell. It can be Python. It can be Ruby. This is an incredibly common paradigm. And in fact, the file name doesn't even have to end in .php for this to work. You can call it anything you want. And arguably, for a command line script, you shouldn't call it .php, because the convention is typically for executable programs, even if they're interpreted scripts, to not have some file extension. For those unfamiliar, what does env do? Because this is not the path to PHP. Exactly. It finds PHP for you. So this is actually a nice portable way of writing a script that is more likely, not guaranteed, to work on other people's computers as well. But conversely, PHP is usually in slash user slash bin slash PHP or slash user slash local slash bin slash PHP. If you hard code any of those and then give your code to someone else, they might have to manually change the file. So env just lowers the probability of issues like that. Um, constants. So this is one way you could do it. This is just good convention. If you've been using variables, maybe they're even capitalized variables. Eh, yeah, that's fine, especially for a small script. You're not likely to change the values, and you're only using them once. But in general, using constants is a good thing. And a better thing, frankly, would be to put it in some other uh, file, or maybe even take it as a command line argument, just so that the script's a little less hard-coded. <laughs> um, what's this doing? Well, you can use argv um, in PHP to take command line arguments. Right, so this was one design decision I made with my command line script. I want to be able to rerun this on different files. Maybe I'm going to start using different saving copies of XML files from every day that I get the feed from the registrar. So I want to just be able to run this, not with a hard-coded file name, but I want it to take as an argument at argv1 
the name of a file, which I just convey the idea of with this statement here. Die, for those unfamiliar, means exit with this particular error message. Um, this is the use of some exceptions. We'll see a little more of this in Objective-C, but you can read it pretty top to bottom. Try this, and if it fails, catch the error and do this with it. Well, just die and call the get message method inside of the exception object that was thrown, that I've caught, which somehow embodies whatever it is that went wrong. It's probably a typo, it's wrong username, wrong password, something to that effect. Now notice, this is not super friendly to just die with an arcane error message, but realize the user base here. This script is for me and my fellow developers to use. It's not for users. We don't have to dumb things down or simplify things. In fact, I want more technical information. So that's reasonable. Now let's just fast forward to the actual loading part. Um, so I regret not having mentioned that what that IBM article does is idiotic by putting an XML file inside of a PHP file. I have no idea why they did that because you can take an XML file and just load it directly from disk. So my apologies if you went that way at their advice. I see some smiles or horrified smiles. Um, <laughs> that is just the wrong solution and I don't know why they did that. They should have just said take this XML file or given an XML file. So here it turns out, simple XML load file will load an XML file into a big string and then parse it and hand you back the so-called DOM, which if you think back to 50 is the tree-like structure that represents a web page or in this case an XML document. I'm just checking the error messages and for those who don't recall or are unfamiliar, what's e uh, equals equals equals? Yeah, so this is um, checking for a quality of value and also type. So this is actually in PHP a good habit to get into um, because PHP is so loose when it comes to data typing. This way you're not going to confuse a value of zero, which is not like it won't actually happen here. But in the interest of like really rigorous code, saying that I not only want it to equal the equivalent of false, it has to be literally false. And because the documentation says literally false will be returned. Now we'll come back to this in a moment, but if you're not using using transactions, this is something that would have been good to use in your import script, or if still working on it, would be, for reasons we'll see in a moment. So first, my script deletes everything from the database. Now here is the motivation for transactions. If you are updating your XML database, and you have actual users shopping for courses on your site, what happens if you have some bug or mistake in your code or your server is just slow, you probably don't want to dump your whole database while users are shopping because all of a sudden they're going to see nothing, potentially. It might be a small window of time, but it could happen. The transaction is going to ensure that all of this is going to happen for me atomically. And so in theory, the users should not notice because their queries will get serialized before my transaction and after, not in the middle. So now I do this, and this you probably have code like this. So let me wave my hands at some of the DOM parsing code, just, but just to give you a sense of what I did. I'm iterating over each course. I am then just doing a filter here. And you don't, um, we said you have to minimally support fall uh, spring 2012, so that's what I'm minimally doing here by filtering out the others. Um, I'm extracting some values. As an aside, I'm explicitly casting a lot of my values to strings, because even though you don't quite need to know this when using simple XML, they do some fancy PHP trickery so that anytime you ask for a value back using, using the simple XML API, you actually get back an object. And there's a lot of implicit conversion to a string, which is why you can print those things from simple XML. But I'm explicitly changing it to strings because I want a string. But this is just a more nitpicky detail that um, I decided to embrace. Um, but again, this code's all online if you want to borrow parts of it as needed. And then I did this. And you might have done something differently, but can you can infer from my code what I did here and why? What's the motivation for this one-liner? It's obviously remembering department, but how? What am I really building up more technically here? Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, so I want to essentially, looks where I'm going with this is I'm going to iterate over all the courses. And as I do that, I'm going to build up a cache of all of the departments I see. <laughs> but I'm not just going to add the department to an array per se. What am I instead doing here? Yeah, I'm caching it based on the code. So I'm, I have an associative array or a hash table here called departments. And then notice the square brackets. I'm indexing into it using a string value, which is totally legit in PHP. And as an aside, if I didn't have this here, this line of code would fail because I'd be trying to use an object as a key. So I needed to explicitly make it a string. So I'm putting in the department code, which is something like comp psi. And then what am I putting as its value? 
So it's short name, computer science. So what does this help me avoid? If I had just used a simple an array and appended to an array again and again, what would I get? I'd get a huge departments array with like 100 copies of computer science, if there's 100 computer science courses. So this way, I'm ensuring uniqueness. So on the first iteration, this is useful because I'm getting comp sci equals computer science. On subsequent iterations, I'm blowing away that same value. So if I really wanted to be anal, I could first say, is it set? If so, continue, else do this, but this is a nice one-liner for just building up a nice key value store that I can later iterate over. All right, so it would have been nicer if FAS just gave us a separate departments XML file, but we have to infer it from courses. I'm going to do the exact same trick for course group, um, and then I'm going to do the following. So if you're not using prepared, this was one of the opportunities for PDO, which we talked briefly a bit about last week. Notice that um, at the very top of the code, I created my connection to the database. Let me quickly go back to that. That was right uh, here. So recall that I created this database handle, dbh, using the username and password. So notice now what I'm doing. I want to insert the current course into one of my tables. And I'm not inserting all the fields that you care about for the project. I'm just doing some basic ones. So notice I get this statement ready. It's wrapping because of the font size. But insert into course these several fields, these several values. What do the colons denote before each value? Yeah, it's, it's like placeholder. It's like a fancy version of uh, percent %s. Put something here. What do I want to put there? Well, notice I'm preparing an associative array. And I could have done this in one line, but I wanted to just make it more readable as code. So I'm creating an associative array of catnum to this, course group to this. And those fields I got earlier, recall, from the XML. Why am I doing this, these two one-liners with the ternary operator? What design decision did I apparently make in my database? And recall that numint and numchar, they're actually optional, right? There's math A, which doesn't have a number, but there's computer science 50, which doesn't have a char. Um, since you're only going to have one or the other, you have the option to make it null. Right. So I made the conscious choice, and we'll see this if we go over to PHP MyAdmin, that because not all courses have a numint or have a numchar, rather than just concatenate them, I'm going to still keep them separate just because that's what I wanted to do. But what's nice about PDO2 is that I can explicitly pass in null if I want that field in my database to actually be null as opposed to the empty string. Now why? Functionally, it might not have a huge difference, but just in terms of um, design, if you have no value for the char or the int, you really should be putting in null. So that's the role of this. So if, there is, if this is empty, the num int variable is empty, let's actually insert null for num int. Otherwise, let's insert the actual int. Same deal for description. And I only realized description accidentally. I was skimming through my database tables, and I realized, wow, some of these courses don't have descriptions. Let me go back, make it a null value optionally. Now I'm executing the statement using PDO. And again, there's no new SQL here. This is all like CS50 style SQL, just with a different library on top of it. But this is what's interesting. Why am I conditionally calling this rollback method? Think back to last week's discussion of databases. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. In case something fails, I want to roll back to the point at which I began my transaction. And this is mostly self-defense. Like, I don't doubt that at some point I'm going to screw this script up, or FAS is going to tweak the data in such a way that the, whole, the query is going to fail because there's some field missing now. And so what I want to make sure that when I'm at midnight running this update script, or I'm using a cron job to do this automatically, if anything goes wrong that was unanticipated, especially while I'm sleeping, I don't want to leave the database in an inconsistent state. I want this whole import to happen or not at all. So the motivations for transactions here are huge. Because what this means is that even at the very last course, course number 4,000 whatever, if there's some kind of syntax error in my code or some kind of logical error in the XML file and that insert fails, no problem, the whole thing fails. Now, our, of course, the, now the, the application has stale data, but at least it has data, and it has correct data, albeit from 24 hours ago. So the worst thing you could do is get your database into some funky state where you maybe have duplicate courses or some courses and things dropping off. So transactions are a huge help with this. They're not just about avoiding race conditions. They're about enforcing atomicity. So it all happens or not at all. So I roll back there, and now recall that I have faculty here, so let me wave my hands at some of this as being um, useful if you want to read up on it at home and improve your own code. But I'm doing something similar now for instructors, iterating over each of the course's faculty. But then notice later on, only at the very bottom, let's see, uh, 
Yeah, I didn't bother. Actually, you know what? I started doing it. I started, I have the array of departments, but I actually decided, because it was no longer enlightening uh, for lecture, there is no departments table. So I don't actually use that data. But I, what I do have is this join table. So we talked a bit about this last week. Recall that if you have two pieces of data, like courses, and courses have instructors, but that's a many-to-many -many relationship, where a course can have many instructors, and an instructor can teach many courses, you kind of have to somehow be able to rejoin instructors with courses. And so a very common paradigm in SQL, in relational databases, is you have a third table, a join table, that's named similar to both tables, where you take one word from one table, <laughs> underscore one word from another, or something like that. And what does this have, apparently? This table has catnum, comma, instructor ID. So what I'm doing here is in my third table, I'm making sure that I can reconstruct the association of faculty with courses by having this third table. And we'll actually talk to that table in code in just a moment. Yeah? Would um, doing an insert and ignore for departments being as, a lot more costly than the method you would have done? No, insert and ignore is actually good. And I'm actually doing it. Yeah, well, let's see. Why did I do it here? Uh, th actually, this is copy, paste, fail. This one was necessary. Why did I do insert, ignore into instructors? This was deliberate. Right? Like, so Malin teaches two courses. And if I have on my instructor's table a unique, a primary key on instructor ID, the second time I try to insert Malin for, say, the second course, CS164, I would actually get a SQL error, which means I would trigger that if condition, which means I would roll back just because I happen to teach two courses. And same deal for any other instructor. So I do an ignore here, because this is telling SQL it is not an error to, be a to fail to insert this row if it's already there because of a key collision. So I don't need it elsewhere, because unless the data is wrong, I don't need it for the joint table. So that, could, that same approach could work for departments? Absolutely. It would be a perfect approach for departments as well. But it assumes that you've defined a unique key, namely a primary key on instructors. So here's the quick tour. I mean, my courses table, which is probably simpler than yours. I have this structure here, catnum, course group, num int, num char. And I counted up sort of late at night how many numbers are actually in a catnum and how many are in uh, some of these other ones to just get an upper bound. I could be off by one. So don't take my numbers as uh, holy grail. But here's my fields. Notice how many of them I said can be null over on the right. And then if I scroll down to indexes, which of these fields should probably have a key on it? Some kind of index, rather? So catnum should probably have a primary key. And you know what? If I'm often searching on something else, what's another good candidate for an index? What's that? Uh, yeah, so title, yeah, if I want to do like-based searches on title, maybe course group if I want to get all comp sci courses, for instance, and so forth. So a number of design decisions there. And then lastly, instructors is pretty similarly structured, ID first and last. Um, and then course instructors is the interesting one. And this one we'll actually use in code now in just a moment. And this is how we tie the two together. So consider this representative, if imperfect and incomplete, of the kinds of decisions that you might still want to make if you're finding that your own decisions weren't quite panning out as optimal. All right. So, oh, and lastly, lest you use a script like this and then wonder why it doesn't work, there's one line of code that's super important, this. Okay, that's like the save before quitting feature. So that commits the entire transaction and all of the queries that you'd executed up until then. All right, so let's do this. Any questions? Okay, one announcement then from Tommy. Let me, just, my mic's over here, so. This is going to be awkward. <laughs> Just, that's fine. Just okay, so just a reminder that seconds are starting this week. If you find yourself having trouble with code igniting, you know, what is MVC? How do these various components interact? And you haven't really made as much headway as you would have liked on your first project, definitely encourage you to come along to the first section and all the other sections that we'll be having um, each week. They'll be filmed, um, so they'll be available if you can't make it in person. Um, but they're definitely more of an opportunity for you to engage a little bit more with the material and provide a little more guidance on all the projects. Okay. So 4 p.m. Pierce 301 this Wednesday. And future Wednesdays, Wednesdays the GCAL captures the schedule. All right, so let's do this. Um, let's, let's suppose we want to actually implement an API for courses. And what is an API in this sense? It's really our own model. So it's a PHP implementation of uh, API via which we can talk to a courses database. And we're going to borrow some of these design patterns, namely uh, DAO and the singleton pattern, to accomplish the following. First, let me go ahead and load 
courses.php. This is example zero if you're following along on paper or online or want to afterward today. So this is it for now. Let's actually have this DAO class that does relatively little, but it gives us this helper method that earlier I called getCourses. So getCourses purpose in life for now is to return for me an array of um, courses from my database. Now let's look at some of the salient characteristics here. So one, in reverse order, what am I doing down here? I have in my getCourses method a courses array that's initially empty. Then I'm doing this. Anyone know what this one liner is doing besides getting an instance? Or what is that representative of? Uh, so this isn't quite factory. Factory actually would churn out multiple objects, a new one every time it's called. This is logging into the database. And this is, this is actually an embodiment of that singleton pattern, whereby I've decided with version 0, you know what, I'm going to talk to the same database all the time. My project's not yet complex enough that I need multiple databases. So singletons are OK for the database. And a very common paradigm, though it can take other forms, is to have a class, let's call it database, and then a method inside of it called getInstance, that it could be called anything. Java people tend to write it this way. And what it does is it returns a database object. But if you call it again, it returns the same database object again and again and again. And the upside of this is that probably that method is doing my connection to the database, and then I can funnel all of my queries through it. But I don't need to go through the overhead. For those familiar with networking, there's no overhead of TCP connections, connecting to the database, authenticating. All of that takes milliseconds, which I don't want to spend cyclically. So let's suppose for now that I now have my database handle. This is equivalent, if you think back, to the return value of MySQL Connect in CS50. So now I execute this query. Query. It's not a prepared statement. It's just a raw query. Select star from courses. And then in PDO, this is the equivalent, this uh, third to last line, of MySQL fetch a SOS to get an associative array. All right, and I just copied this from the documentation after reading up on the fetch method. So what is this doing? In a loop, it's getting an associative array from the courses table and putting it in the variable called row. And then this syntax here is appending to my courses array that row again and again and again. So what do I get in the end? I get a huge array of courses. And each of those course is represented not with a class, but how? What data structure am I using at the moment to represent a course? So just an associative array. So it's a very poor man's approach to storing data in some kind of structure. Um, in fact, this is almost what CodeIgniter does. CodeIgniter instead returns to you a standard class object. The only functional difference is that you then use arrow notation to access fields instead of square bracket notation. That's really the only difference. And here, too, is where CodeIgniter's yeah, nice and simple, learning curve relatively low, um, but sloppy. Like it's not actually returning to me a course object. So we can improve upon this. So let's actually see this in action. I wrote a terribly simple test script just to see what's happening. So I'm importing um, courses. And I'm calling get courses as follows. But we'll come back to the syntax in a moment. And then I'm just printing recursively that array. So let me go ahead and run. Whoops. All right, so what did I do wrong? Unknown database. Oh, sorry. I need to change my database to use not project zero, but lecture two. Sorry. OK. So something's wrong. Courses. Ah, oh, that's why. Thank you, Tommy. OK. Uh, database. Let's do this week's lecture. Oh, thank God. OK. That could. <laughs> That could have gotten awkward fast. All right. So um, all it did, act, that was a little too fast. All it did was it dumped a huge associative array. Right Before I hit Control C, we were up to uh, location of 1,011, each of which is an associative array. So not bad. And in fact, each of these associative arrays is you know, it's kind of nice. It's kind of like encapsulating information. But there's no methods associated with it. They're completely public, these fields. I can change them accidentally and the like. So we can do a little better. But a word on syntax, why do I have these double Double colons here. Courses colon colon get courses. What does the double colon denote in PHP? Yeah. Yeah. So it's what's called a static method. And if you remember, if you took a PCS or something similar, if you remember nothing else from Java other than the fact that every week you wrote public, static, void, main, static does have special meaning in these various languages. And in the context of PHP. 
the static keyword, which I actually did have here in the file we looked at a moment ago, means that this class called courses will have one and only one copy of this method. And that's actually not quite true, because you're not going to have multiple copies of a method per se when you have multiple objects. But rather, it means you do not need to instantiate this class called courses in order to call this method. So in as much as get courses in my mind, it's like a helper method. I want to be able to call it, but I don't want to have to instantiate a stupid courses object just to call one method inside of it. The static approach allows me to express exactly that. I can just say, as we saw, courses get course, or get courses, and I can do something like this. If I did not have the static method, I would instead have to do something like this. Um, let's say. Let's say uh, courses model gets new courses. Then I can say courses gets courses model arrow gets courses. So I could call these things anything I want. But the point is that for the DAO um, design, design pattern, whereby you essentially have a layer of abstraction in code in front of your database, and you want to provide helper functions like get courses, it's not strictly necessary to instantiate an object, because I'm not encapsulating any information. It's really just returning a whole bunch of data from the database. Yeah? So it's like the equivalent of a class method. Yeah, exactly. It is a class method. Static means class method to be more precise, exactly. And we'll see these same kinds of things actually in Objective-C next week. All right, so back to this. What's inside of this database class? It's actually the same idea. So in the database class, I made a few design decisions. I'm using const. So PHP actually has a const keyword that allows me to specify inside of a class some number of constants. So I'm just copying and pasting DSN, password, and user. Um, why did I put used const instead of just using the define function as we've used before? Like why put these constants inside of the class all of a sudden as opposed to at the top of the file like we've been doing for some time and did in 50? Yeah. You don't want them to be globally yeah, it's simple as that. Like now we're sort of getting better at designing software and encapsulating related information. There's no reason that I need to pollute my global namespace, so to speak, with these constants that have only something to do with the database and have nothing to do with courses per se or any other code or PHP's own framework code um, at all. So I might as well scope them as narrowly as possible so that only the guy who cares about them can access them. So by putting them inside of this class, I ensure that they're still accessible. And in fact, these are now, they're actually globally accessible as class constants, which itself is a bad thing. But we can fix this. But for now, the point is that we've encapsulated them. Um, and if I scroll down, here's my get instance method. And this is actually quite common in PHP um, if you want to have static uh, variables as well. So notice this method is static, which means I do not need to instantiate a database class. By contrast, in CodeIgniter, when you load the database library, as you did by changing that configuration file, thereafter you can say dollar sign this arrow db. That is instantiating a database object for you to use, even though it just has various helper methods inside. The singleton approach is not necessarily best, because we already said earlier, if you want to have two database connections, you're kind of screwed in this model. So this is not necessarily great, but for our simple the problem here of just a course uh, project, it's pretty reasonable. So you can also have, and this is fundamentally unrelated here, static variables inside of a method. <laughs> what a static variable is inside of a method is a variable that there's only one copy of. And even after that method returns, the next time you call it, that variable will have the previous value. So it retains state. It's a way of calling a method. And even though normally, recall that when functions are called, you build up the stack frame, you tear down the stack frame up and down, and therefore you're losing those variables. By having a static variable inside of a method or function, you're essentially saying, OK, you can have the stack frame back, but let me save that variable's value so the next time it's called, it has retained its previous value. So the upside of this is the following. If I want to ensure that I'm only ever once instantiating a new PDO object with these three constants, and that's the syntax for accessing a class constant, self colon colon, notice I just check. If dbh is not set, go ahead and set it by instantiating this object, else just return the previous instantiation. So it's a very common paradigm in PHP to ensure that you only do something expensive once, and thereafter you uh, cache that information. Now, for those of you with more savvy with object-oriented programming already, if your mind's kind of fast-forwarding, we could do this another way. We could get rid of all, both static keywords. 
We could require the user to instantiate a database object, and we could store as a private data member of that object the DBH handle. So we instantiate and store it inside the object, but because we have no objects, because we're adhering to the singleton model right now, we have to store it inside of secretly the method itself. So back to the courses class, this is where what we used that connection for. And then back to the test routine, that's all it did. So any questions on this approach, which is actually pretty clean. It's sort of a nice beginning of an API for accessing course data via a PHP code as opposed to having to care about SQL queries yourself. Right? This is code I could write and then say to my partner, here's some code you can call if you want to access courses. So it's very similar in spirit to the sort of model code you need to write or you've had to write for Project Zero. All right, so let's improve this. In version one, and there's only four versions today, not 11, let's go into courses again, and notice that this time the method looks a little different. So instead of calling fetch and saying give me an associative array, what am I apparently saying to PDO instead to give me? Yeah, so apparently I've changed fetch to fetch object, which does what it says. So it fetches an object. It apparently takes an argument. And this just tells PDO, what object do you want me to hand you back? So we talked about constructors briefly earlier. And some of you might already have that experience. What fetch objects will do is it will automatically call new course. And then it will fill that object with public properties corresponding to what came from the database. So instead of getting an associative array, you instead get an object. But unlike CodeIgniter, which hands you a generic object, you instead get a course object, which is going to have some value to us in just a moment. So now this time, I'm still returning an array, but it's an array of course objects. So who cares? What does this allow us to do? Well, now what I can do is introduce one more file. So we did not have a course.php file a moment ago. So now we can actually model this real world entity. I didn't put much effort into it. But we do now have a more semantically properly named container than just a generic associative array. Now, not compelling, right? This is meant to just be a stepping stone. Because what can we now do with this? Well, if I go into my test routine, I can now at least at treat this course in a loop as though it's an object. Again, could just be generic, but at least I'm taking a step toward making a course object. So what is this going to do? The output's going to be similar in spirit, PHP test. But first, let me open the database and change project 0 to lecture 3. I'm going to run PHP of test.php. This too, if unfamiliar, if you need to write little test scripts, you don't need the shebang. You can actually say, call PHP, interpret this file, enter. So now I see all the titles from several thousand courses. So let's do one better than this now. Let me go into version 2 and look at now the course class. So now I'm being a little more proper. And I'm also implementing that paradigm of, insert buzzword here, so lazy loading. Right? So now I've decided that, you know what, having a course class with nothing in it is pretty useless. Right? I might as well just use the associative arrays and not waste my time pretending to write, be writing better code. But what if the goal of this class is to provide with the course entity related functionality. And that functionality might be get me the instructors, which is not a feature we supported a moment ago. So if I want to now say that there's a method associated with a course object. Notice how I can implement this. So one, I have an empty instructors array. Two, I get my database instance. And now this is more compelling. Now I'm talking to the database from multiple classes. So it's a little more compelling that I use this singleton approach. Now I prepare a statement, select star from instructors where, and what's going on here? Well, if unfamiliar, you don't need to join all the time to get to reunite multiple tables. If you want to select data from one table based on values in a second, join is not necessarily the solution. And in fact, it might give you back way more data than you care about. So this means get me all the instructors whose faculty ID is in the result of this nested query. So here I'm saying select instructor ID. The name doesn't have to be identical, but the number of things outside and inside the parens needs to be the same. Select instructor ID from course instructors where catalog number equals catalog number. So the nested query gets me all of the faculty who teach that course. But I don't just want their ID. I want actually their name and their first name and their last name. So my outer query ensures that I actually get back the data I care about. So now I execute this. I call fetch object. This time I want back an instructor object. I store the instructor in the array and return that array. All right. So I, this is really 
confusing or just really boring. So let me try to spice it up by showing you what you can now do with this little test file. So here's where now the fact that we've introduced this additional model for course individually, for an individual course, starts to get more useful. So now I can still call get courses as I did before. I can now still iterate over each course as I did before. I can still print each course's title as I did before. But now notice I can iterate over each course's instructors and then access its name, which suggests that inside of the instructor class is a name method. Why do I have a name method? Why not just output the name with the arrow notation with no method call? Think back to project zero and the data you've actually been using. Why? This is actually another good motivation for introducing a wrapper class called instructor rather than just rely on public properties. Yeah? Two reasons. One is that you don't want it to be mutable. Okay. The other one would be that sometimes it's like null. Okay. You don't want to say like null. You want to have the wrapper say, oh, there's no name, say name to be true. Oh, those, so those are actually uh, two great ones. So on, just for the camera. So one, we have, if it's null, you want to make sure that maybe we want to spit out unknown professor or something like that rather than just the empty string. And then in the first case, we want to make sure that you can't change the person's name, right? Their name is their name from the database. You don't want to accidentally mutate that property by just using the simple arrow notation and the uh, property name so the method protects that information. And then, yeah? Well, the particular data set we're using doesn't have a single field for name. That's Perfect. Right, so there's like the prefix field, the suffix field for junior, senior, and all of that. There's the first name field, the last name field, the middle name field. My god, there's like five things. And your code would look atrocious if you, the, you, the end user, had to concatenate together all five of these fields. What better opportunity to have this layer of abstraction where you call the name method and it does that reassembly for you based on what fields were actually in the database. So if I go into my instructor class, notice this is the additional file I just introduced. And I go into instructor, that's exactly what I'm doing. I actually cut some corners, as you might have seen quickly in PHP MyAdmin. I didn't bother with prefix and suffix. But just having two fields is still compelling. Now, there is one gotcha here aesthetically. If someone's missing a first name or last name, I'm going to return a sort of ugly formatted string. So I should probably clean that up. But this is what's so nice now about object-oriented programming in general. If my partner yells at me a week later and says, hey, there's some guy with a missing first name, and so you're returning a space and then his last name, I can go back and fit clean this up without my partner's code having to change at all. So you agree again on this contract of methods and properties. So there's one thing still wrong here. If I look again in my courses method, uh, uh, methods, notice that I'm just using fetch object. I'm instantiating a course object. And then again, PDO is just filling that object's fields for me. Specifically, what is the fetch object doing? It's literally doing something like this. It's saying something like, object gets new course, and then PDO is doing this for me. Gets row, let's say uh, this is course, so let's say catnum. Whoops. Oh, catnum. And then it's doing this. So all the fetch object method is doing for me is it's not doing anything fancy with constructors or with object-oriented programming, really. It's just doing that. And then what it's returning to me is this. So it's saving me that trouble. And that has value. This is kind of clean that it deals with this for me. But what's the implication for catnum and title if I am creating objects using PDO in this way in terms of visibility of those properties? They're public. Right? And that was not the best decision we decided earlier. So on the one hand, oh, so clean and easy. I call one method. I get back the class I want, the object I want. It's not the best design. So can we do a little better? Well, let's go in here and see in version 3 in courses. Notice that I'm doing this, fetch object course. All right. So let's see here. Let me go into course this time. Oops, that's in there. Let's see. Uh, for instructor. So we won't bother with course. We'll I just did it with instructor, because it would be redundant to do them in both. Now notice I went into the instructor's method, which previously just had a name. Sorry, instructor's class, which previously just had an, a name method. And I've explicitly said, you know what? This class is going to have a private ID, private first, private last variable. My partner can see this if he wants to look at my code, but this means nothing to him or her. In fact, he or her, she cannot access any of these private data members if they're using my objects. But notice what I can still do. 
If I now have an explicit constructor that takes three arguments, we can do what we said we could do earlier. We construct an instructor object, we assign those three values privately, and then if you want to access the name, well, you still use this public method. So notice we've commingled two public methods with three private properties. And as an aside, methods can also be private if you need to write something yourself, but you don't want your partner or someone else to be able to access it. So if we now go into the course class, notice that down here, I am doing this a little more properly. I'm getting from my course instructors table and my instructors table a whole bunch of rows again and again and again and I'm going back to the regressing a bit to the associative array approach so that I now can take more control over the instantiation of my instructor objects and instead say give me a new instructor with this ID this row this uh, this first name this last name and now I have a much more rigorous design wrapping all of this data and so this here version 3 for instructors is actually now pretty solid any questions all right, so where does this leave us? So looking ahead to project one, which again will pretty much be create whatever you would like that's appealing to you and your partner, can solve a real world campus problem if you'd like, or it can just be fun for you. Um, realize, especially if among those with more experience, realize that a lot of the frustrations you might have felt with something like Code Igniter and its reliance on fairly generic objects, its commingling of different paradigms like Active Record and DAO, um, realize that there are proper um, object relational mapper libraries out there, which essentially automate a lot of the discussion we just had, whereby you configure a library like Doctrine or Propel are two of the most popular for PHP, you essentially teach the library what your tables are, what the relationships are between those tables, and it provides you with your own courses class. It provides you with your own course class and the like. Now again, project one does not need to be about course catalog, and odds are you won't go that direction um, based on project zero's experience. But um, realize that a lot of the stuff we just built from scratch can also be built for you automatically so that you can focus on the interesting parts and not just the data modeling. Also for frameworks, if you'd kind of like to take things, in the, I would advise this. If among those who took 50 just in the fall and you're maybe struggling through CodeIgniter and MVC, but frankly after another week and a half, two weeks, you'll at least be in a better place of comfort most likely, by all means stay in that zone and go with what you're now more comfortable with and build your first uh, student's choice project based on CodeIgniter and jQuery Mobile. Um, we're not expecting that you go yet further above and beyond that, all the better if you get more comfort and mastery with that material. But if, again, you've interned elsewhere, you're a senior, you're a junior, and you have much more experience under your belt and would like to use this as an excuse to take things to the next level and expose yourself to some framework that you would actually use in some real world project, these are some of the most uh, popular ones there um, in essentially um, yeah, just in alphabetical order. Zend is the only one that I would personally recommend again, since I've never once understood any code that Zend produces. Um, <laughs> they have ample documentation, but even the documentation, my brain never actually understands. I can say, and Tommy will probably could say in a uh, section on Wednesday, um, we've become fans of Yi um, among the ones here on the list. But the learning curve is higher, but the power, uh, the, uh, its feature set more rich, and its design a little cleaner. So that's it for today. I'll stick around for one-on-one -on -one questions. Otherwise, do take advantage of section and code reviews this week.